Would you call yourself a hacker? Mm, no. I mean, it's always the same stupid question. Um, I guess there are some hackers who would call me a hacker, and others would call me a cracker, and others would call me a lazy ass destroyer. Um, there are a lot of dirty names for people like me. But these different terms, they describe very different activities. Are there any precise definitions and to which one would you like to refer? Well, there is something called the jargon file. Um, it was put together by ter different people in the hacker scene beginning in the 70s. It's a perfect reference book for all terms referring to hacking. You can find anything you're looking for it in it. In short, hackers had gotten a lot of bad publicity. The scene had um, come up with this idea for distinguishing between good and bad hackers, and the bad ones were called crackers. I don't know if this was a good idea at any rate. This distinction never made its way to a broader public, and more or less it's a way for hackers who consider themselves to be good to feel okay about themselves, and I might fit any of these descriptions or none, depending on what I'm doing at the time. I do a lot of different things. You came uh, here to Europe, to Berlin, for the Chaos Communication Congress. Did you enjoy the Congress? Well, you know, it's always worth it to go places. You meet a lot of interesting people, you get the latest information. There was a lot of excellent stuff in the program, like information warfare or information operations, whatever they prefer to call it, and Echelon, which is a part of Project 415. Well, that sounds as if you were mostly interested in the political aspects of information technology. Every aspect of information technology is political. And it's definitely true that I'm very much concerned with the idea of electronic resistance on the net and political activism. I mean, hackers are the spearhead of this new form of resistance, and they have enormous political potential, although most of them aren't aware of it. There are also other political activists who fight for their goals outside of the net and use the net as a site for their dissent. Mm -hmm. And uh, what would you say, what, what forms or what are the forms electronic resistance takes today? Well, that's a very delicate question. I mean, in the end there aren't many. I mean, the few existing forms are very controversial. I mean, there's an example in the mid-90s, the group Critical Art Ensemble published a book called electronic civil disobedience. Um, the basic assumption of the book is that power and representations of power are no longer located in the real world but have been shifted into the nets. Um, that's why the resistance against power has also got to take place within the nets. Um, they developed a model by transferring civil disobedience from real life into the virtual world and called it electronic civil disobedience. And what it's about is blocking the flow of information rather than the flow of personnel. And it takes place at military, corporate, or governmental sites. Their basic assumptions are proven right simply by the extent to which these locations are defended and the extent to which trespassers are punished. The greater the intensity of defense and punishment, the greater the power value. And as I'm sure you are aware of, hackers are punished severely for what they do. And this means that they are operating at the right sites. Okay. So, but what is the controversy about? Well, the controversy is about the direct translation of theoretical model into practice. Uh, the name of this concrete form is denial of service attack, DOS. Um, it basically means remotely disabling machines by flooding them with more traffic than they can handle. You can ev effectively cripple any network, regardless of the size or bandwidth, um, with this method. So in minutes, all 
network activity on the attack server is shut down because the attack consumes all available network resources. So to automate this process, all you need are simple scripts which are used to generate endless traffic. Okay, I guess almost everybody has heard of the recent attacks on some e-commerce sites. Uh, they were also committed with the same tools, with the tools you just described. To me, it sounds like a very targeted attack. Why is it contested by most hackers? Well, there are various forms of DOS attacks. Um, all work slightly differently and they use different scripts. So at the moment, the so-called um, distributed DOS attacks are most common. That means they are launched from various servers and use spoofed um, IP numbers as senders and involve millions of packets. These attacks consume not just the targeted networks bandwidth, but all of the customers as well. So the execution is not very precise and it's not very particularly graceful. And instead of ensuring the free flow of information, which was one of the basic principles of hacking, DOS attacks actually do the opposite. Mm -hmm. And um, there are more rational reasons, uh, or actually this is one of the more rational reasons against DOS, um, but there are kind of irrational reasons why people don't like them. Like they say the perpetrators are childish, they're malcontent, they're lacking in technical skill, or they're just accused of doing it for revenge and the attacks seem worthless. But what do you personally think of these attacks? Well, first of all, I would like to note that the people, um, especially hackers, are gaining more and more power. The computer networks um, are one big display of power and somehow, by mistake, they sold millions of computers to the people. And we made them rich by buying these machines. But now we have the weapons. So obviously they didn't think when they sold us these tools because the last thing governments want is power to the people. So with regard to DOS attacks, um, all the people I know who carry out such attacks are skilled hackers. Secondly, um, those people think about who they're attacking and why. So it's not just some stupid script kitty who doesn't know what he's doing. For these people, it's um, one form of resistance among many others. So they work on free software, crypto, Photography, etc. I, you know, I don't really want to promote DOS as the best form, but we don't really have a better one yet. So it's it's still um, waiting to be developed, and it develops by trial and error. Um, I guess the one good point about it certainly is that it attracts a lot of attention. It makes um, evident where power accumulates, and um, the people who execute these things don't usually get busted. So if you do it intelligent, um, it's, very, it's very secure. And blocking information access is the best means to disrupt any institution, whether military, corporate, or governmental. Let's have a word about the attacks on these e-commerce sites, which happened mid-February. Well, history does repeat itself, you know, it takes us back to the first instance of successful um, DOS about 1994. Um, it was um, an action taken against the Mexican government by the Electronic Disturbance Theater, which sent Port 80 requests for bad pages looking for human rights and that kind of thing. So, from a technical point of view, the attacks were no surprise, at least not for professionals. You know, the, the tools you need um, to do that kind of thing have been around for a while. It was just a question of time as to when someone would use them for a major attack. And because it works so well, I think it's going to be copied quite a bit. Um, interestingly enough, um, the attacks um, came a couple of days after Clinton's proposal to massively expand the budget for electronic um, law enforcement. 
This led some people to the conclusion that the Secret Service um, may have launched these attacks <laughs> themselves in order to create panic, which would make it um, easier to pass that budget. But for me, it was the other way around. If um, the government um, is begging for alternative wars and for cyber terrorism, then they deserve to get it. I mean, this new deadly threat they're envisioning was coming true, and that's just the beginning. I mean, seriously, uh, the way a technical infrastructure works today and how insecurities are handled, um, it doesn't ensure stability for the internet. The interesting point is that actual stability um, for the internet is in no relation to the huge values being projected on it. I mean, it's healthy to shake things up a bit and burst some bubbles. Um, cyberspace isn't secure, and it never will be. So it, it doesn't make sense um, to make a belief system out of any kind of technology, be it commercial or um, for reasons of power, or even to improve the world for that matter. Claire, you are operating in a dominantly male domain. Does that cause problems for you? And do you fight, or do you have to fight for equal rights? And would you consider yourself as a feminist? Mm, yeah, my experience is that most hackers hate feminists. So um, that would be reason enough for me to call myself a feminist, <laughs> but um, I'm not a big fan of isms in general and like um, hackism, um, but the fact is that we are far from having equal rights. The big question is that um, we need to be thinking about what strategies will actually work today. Okay, did you ever hear of cyber feminism and what do you think of it? Mm, cyber feminism is weird. <laughs> I mean, these are just, I don't know, there's these, these fresh girls, you know, whatever, acting up. Um, I don't know, my recommendation would be for them to get their hands a little dirty, get up with the technology, because I think if they transform their rhet rhetoric strategies into technological attacks, they'd be far more deadly. Clara, do you have a vision? What does make you work? I don't know. I mean, at some point you're going to just start to hate the things you love. And sometimes I have a vision of taking down the whole internet um, with the help of my friends, of course. Um, and then, I don't know, I might think about becoming a musician and a dancer. <laughs> <laughs>